Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of the Model Guy. In this episode we'll be covering the Tamiya 148BF109E. Like most kits rolling off the assembly line from Tamiya in the early 90s, the kit goes together with really no drama. The only thing it's lacking is some detail in the cockpit. This model jumped the queue because I was participating in a Battle of Britain Memorial group build on the AAMG group build group. With everybody mostly selecting Spitfires and Edward also releasing their new Spitfire at the same time, I decided to be a little different and go with the Aggressor aircraft. While I was busying myself building a kit with a swastika on the tail, AK decided to drop their newest marketing video that kind of put a damper on things and had me deciding if I wanted to really do this video or not. It's always a gray area when you're building German aircraft or German equipment because you run the risk of people looking at it and assuming you are a Nazi or you believe in the National Socialism ideology, which, to clarify, I do not. I personally don't believe in hiding the swastika for the sole reason that when my 6-year-old son or 4-year-old daughter or 8-year-old son looks at that swastika and sees it on the tail of the aircraft, they understand what it stands for and the hatred behind it. As a society, we've moved towards a black and white approach to things, and there's no middle ground anymore where people can have an intelligent discussion. It just turns into this thing where I'm right and you're wrong, or you're a Nazi, or etc. The point I'm trying to make, and to trying to do it intelligently, is that when something like a swastika is covered or hidden or pushed away from history, it no longer brings up conversation with people. It's just gone and done with, but... Unfortunately, you can't do that with history. Even if a plastic model doesn't have a swastika on the tail, that doesn't make a difference that 6 million people were murdered by the Nazi party. Like, it still happened, and not having that swastika there doesn't change that. Last week, Matt of Duke's model brought up the point that he couldn't understand why there was so many people doing German aircraft, German equipment, or why there seemed to be a push to kind of make it popular and things like that. The way I counter that is, for me personally, when I'm building something that's German like the BF-109 here, I'm doing it from a purely mechanical point. I'm interested in aircraft, I love aviation, and at the time, in 1937, when the BF-109 entered service, it was one of the most advanced aircraft in the world. It was single-winged, it was all-metal, enclosed cockpit, monocoque design, it was fast, and there wasn't much that could counter it. So when I choose to build something like this, it's not because it looks cool, it's because there's a lot of history behind that aircraft itself, and it's significant in some way or another. Another reason that I'm drawn towards doing German equipment is that at the time in the 40s, some of it was so far ahead and advanced that the Allies were finding themselves having to catch up to it. Another case in point, the FW-190. When that entered service, there was nothing that could touch it, and the British had to significantly upgrade the Spitfire to match it. And last but not least, the first jet fighter ever to enter service was from the German Luftwaffe. So I can definitely see and understand why there's such a draw to those types of models for people to build. One thing that I will agree with Dugon is that if I see somebody's aircraft collection and it's completely or mostly German or especially SS equipment, I'm going to question what their motives are for building it. I think that's a good point for discussion here in the comment section below. Are you someone that looks at German equipment and refuses to do it because it was part of the Nazi Third Reich and everything they stood for? Or are you someone that looks at an aircraft and the engineering and technology from back then and see it as it's standing on its own and not something aligned with the National Socialist Party? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. One thing that I believe we can all agree on is that when AK used imagery from the concentration camps to sell a product, that was completely unacceptable and definitely crossed some lines. That's enough rambling for this video. Let's move on and talk about the BF-109. It was the most produced fighter in World War II. There was almost 34,000 of them made across several variants. But those are also the numbers you can hit when some of your production is taking place in concentration camps through slave labor. And the top three aces of World War II, with almost a thousand aircraft destroyed between them, all fly in the BF-109. One of the reasons that German pilots were able to rack up such high scores is that they didn't have a rotation system like the Americans or the British. The Americans, usually after 50 flights, those pilots would be pulled from service and sent back to the U.S. to serve as instructors, or they'd go on leave for a significant amount of time. And the British, they would pull their pilots back to the rear to work in headquarters and things like that for a break. 
But the Germans did not get that. So if you were flying for five years like Eric Hartman, it would be possible to get over 300 kills. One of the features of the BF-109 that made it so advanced was the fact that it was one of the first aircraft to use slats on the leading edge of the wings. What these do is when the aircraft slows down, because it had such a small wing surface area being a fighter, they would drop and increase the lift of the wing, allowing it to operate at slower speeds. Another thing that Messerschmitt took into account when building the fighter was the fact that it would be serving on front lines and have to be serviced in the field. So when they designed the engine, it was actually designed in such a way that all the harnesses plugged in at the firewall and, all, and most of the coolant lines plugged in at the firewall as well. And they were all color coded so the engine could be pulled out of the aircraft in a matter of minutes. The BF-109 went into production just in time to be shown off at the Berlin Olympics in 1936, also enabling it to be ready for the fighting in the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. It was during the Spanish Civil War that the Luftwaffe was able to try out new tactics such as the ROT, which was fighting with a wingman and never leaving your wingman, and the Finger 4 formation, which was more flexible and allowed the flight to pay less attention to formation flying and more attention to what was going on around it. Unfortunately for the RAF, when they first entered World War II, they were still trying to use parade-style formations with the Vic or in line, which severely hampered their pilots as they were too busy flying formation to keep an adequate lookout for enemy fighters. During the early months of World War II, it was only the Hawker Hurricane that was being sent to Europe to fight the BF-109, and the 109 pilots found that their tactics of bouncing down from above and zooming back up to altitude were proving superior to the British tactics. This gave the Luftwaffe pilots a false sense of security because it wasn't until they ran into the Spitfire for the first time over Dunkirk that they realized that there was an aircraft that matched their own. Once the BF-109 started flying over England during the Battle of Britain, it then found itself at a disadvantage. Because they would be critically low on fuel over England, they could only fight for a few minutes before they'd have to turn and run for the coast. The final nail in the coffin came for the 109s over England when Goring changed tactics. Instead of letting the Messerschmitts fly above the bombers, keep their speed up, and be able to bounce down and have the advantage, they were now ordered to fly alongside the bombers where they'd lose their speed and be sitting ducks for the Spitfires and Hurricanes. With the Luftwaffe unable to destroy the RAF and gain aerial supremacy over England, the Battle of Britain had been lost. The aircraft would, however, continue to serve in frontline service in the Luftwaffe until the closing days of World War II. Now on to the model build. For the first time, I'm doing masks that actually include several steps to it. It's not like the simple solid color of the RAF roundels where it was two colors. I'm now doing trim, which actually required a little bit of touch-up painting. My mistake here was not properly washing the plastic before putting primer on. All those little oils and thing on your fingers, they can affect your paint down the road. You can put all the gloss and future on the paint you like, but it's only as good as the paint underneath it. If that paint doesn't have a good surface to stick to, the gloss isn't going to make it stick any better. I found this BF-109 on the internet with a cool mottled nose that I thought looked different and would make an interesting subject. To give myself a safety net before painting the nose, I put down two coats of lacquer clear and used acrylic paints on top. That way, if I made any mistakes, I could simply come in with a little bit of IPA and wipe it away. The only downfall here is it's very hard to paint this type of thing with the camera right by your nose. I'm still trying to give this Pash Talon airbrush a chance, but I still don't like the way it feathers and it makes it really hard to apply fine painting like this. A lot of this splattering that you're seeing is because the paint's still mixed too thick and that the air pressure is still too high. So those are two things I would change for the next time and to practice it a lot more. So once I was done painting all this, I just used a Q-tip and some IPA and wiped up all that overspray. One tip to trying to use Tamiya's thick decals is to seal them with two coats of clear and then to sand them down to get rid of some of that carrier film. Just do it a little bit at a time and keep checking it to make sure you don't go through the decal. Once it's even with the paint layer, just reseal it with another coat of clear. This gets rid of any steps that'll show up when you start your weathering. Because this build was part of a group build, I was going a little bit quicker than normal, and in doing that, I ended up missing a key step, which was painting the yellow on the nose and the wingtips of the plane. This didn't turn out to be such a big deal, because all I had to do was lay down a few very thin coats of white paint before putting down the yellow to make it pop. Now that the wingtips were painted yellow, that was all the major painting complete, and it was time to seal it all in clear and to apply some weathering. 
I find that these AK colors are a little bit vibrant, but once you apply an oil wash, it definitely knocks them down and makes the paint look a little more realistic in my opinion. Oil washes are very easy to make for yourself and you don't have to spend $10 on buying AK washes when you can just buy some oil paint and some enamel thinner and make the washes yourself. You can mix them to whatever tint you want, black, brown, white, sandy, whatever you want. And by applying that, you're going to dramatically change the tone of your paint. Once the wash is applied over the entire model, I give it some time to dry and then wipe it away with a lint-free paper towel. If this were a larger model, I would only do one or two sections at a time. That way it didn't have too long to dry and then was harder to remove. Now that all my panel lines and rivets are showing the wash, I let this dry for a few days before firing on a flat clear coat to seal it all. If you wanted to speed this process up, you could steal your wife's hair dryer to dry the oil faster. However, being a mechanic, I find oh, sometimes that heat and plastic don't go so well together. The reason for applying a flat coat or a matte coat on top of the model is that's going to make any oils or pigments stick better when doing the last stages of weathering. I find a gloss coat or even the Tamiya semi-gloss is still a little bit too slick and won't let the oil sit in place. They just end up moving everywhere. I still have a hard time using oils to do smoke effects, so I prefer to use an airbrush still for that. This allows me to feather it and really control the effect I want. Because these paints are thinned down so much, it takes them a lot longer to build up. Being the, one of the first German aircraft that I've built in scale, I actually really enjoyed this build, building the colors, the modeling. It just was a well-rounded build, and I can't say anything bad about it. And it's made me look at some other projects I want to do down the line. I also have the Edward FW190 with all the bits for that. And I also have another BF109G in the stash, so you can count on seeing more German stuff on this channel. That's going to be it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've touched some controversial subjects, and I hope that hasn't put you off. If you have liked it, click like, hit subscribe, set the bell so you get all the notifications. And if you didn't like it, please leave a comment below so I can know why and help bring better content. I am the Model Guy, and that is it for now. Oh, and by the way, if you're in the Calgary area on October 3rd this year, which is in about two weeks, I'm going to be at the Gomes Model Show. Make sure you check that out. The details are online. There's lots of fantastic builds there, and I hope you come out and support the community. So long for now. Or are you someone that looks at the engineering at Maisie really right now?